It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is uh, for the Premier. Another week in the uh, longest teacher strike in 25 years has passed, and still high school students in Durham, Peel, and Sudbury are not getting the education they're entitled to. Durham is now in the 25th day of their strike, and those high school students have lost almost a third of their semester, Mr. Speaker. The Premier was a school board trustee. She shouldn't need an obscure commission to tell her what we already know. The school year is in jeopardy. So, Premier, will you act today? Will your back-to-work legislation ensure that these students will finish their school year? And can you promise the grade 12 students that they will graduate in time to continue their studies next September? Thank you. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we share the concern about the students. We understand that the students in Durham, in Rainbow, in Peel have been out of class far too long. That's why uh, a week ago Friday I asked the Education Relations Commission for their advice on Jeopardy. I'm pleased to report that within the last hour I have received the advice from the ERC and they have in fact advised that the school year is in jeopardy in Durham. In <laughs> Would you like the announcement? Order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. The minister the minister of government and consumer services come to order. Please finish. Yes, uh, they have advised that the school year is in jeopardy in Durham, Answer. in Rainbow, and in Peel, and we will be tabling back to work Thank legislation you. this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and a follow-up to the to the question from the leader. Uh, you know, the provincial negotiations have been at an Minister impasse, of Agriculture. and they and they, we know that they they broke down again over the weekend. And your government has Remember now said Prince they will uh, take appropriate action. And I understand just today you say you will table back to work legislation today. But two weeks ago you were going to light a fire, uh, and, and still we've never seen a spark until this very minute when we may see back to work legislation today. I don't know how long that'll actually drag on for. So there has certainly, Mr. Speaker, there certainly hasn't been any sense of urgency on the part of the minister or the uh, the premier. The students are going to lose their entire school year if we do not get them back in the classroom. And take, for example, Durham students alone have been out 25 days today. That's 560,000 student days, Mr. Speaker, in Durham alone. And uh, and on top of that, Question. there's only 25 days left in the year. So already we know there's a real problem with uh, with the getting a, you know getting their school year. Thank so you. I guess what, what we're saying is we're. Um, a reminder to everybody: I give you your cues and I stick with them. Minister. Yes, thank you. The um, the act that we will be uh, introducing this afternoon is obviously designed to get kids back into the classroom. We want the kids back in the we want the kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, second time. Carry on. We, we, in order to get the kids back in the classroom as quickly as possible, we need to pass the legislation. So I am writing to the leaders of both of the opposition parties to ask for their cooperation yes. in getting this legislation passed this afternoon. But we need their cooperation to do that, Speaker. We can't pass the legislation this afternoon unless we have the cooperation of the other two parties. So so uh, I'm waiting to hear their response. Final supplementary. Remember from Simple. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I guess the problem is you, you asked the Education Re Relations Committee ten days ago on May on May the uh, 15th. They never even worked over the long over the uh, the holiday weekend. Neither did the Ontario Labour Relations Board. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, Mr. Speaker, it's a they're going to table back to work. They want everyone to support this today. But the bottom line is. Where has the urgency been, Mr. Speaker? Where has it actually been on behalf of the students in the province of Ontario? We've been, we've been asking.
asking you for weeks now, for weeks to get this thing moving, to get this two-tiered disaster out of the way. So when can we expect the students to be back in the classroom, Mr. Minister? Stop the clock, please. Stop, stop the clock. Stop, stop the clock. Thank you. Minister? I couldn't quite discern the answer, so let's go over this again. A week ago Friday, I asked the Education Relations Commission for their advice. They consulted with everybody involved. I received that advice this morning. Within an hour of receiving that advice, I have informed the Legislature that we will table back to work legislation this afternoon. And I have asked the opposition parties for their uh, cooperation to do, give unanimous consent to passing second and third reading this afternoon so that we can get the kids back in the classroom. It's over to you, folks. You. you get to decide. New question. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. To uh, see my question for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, today the Ombudsman released his uh, scathing report into the billing practices at Hydro One. There's uh, Rebecca Carter, who received bills despite her house having burned down. There's Shannon Laburn, who wasn't billed for over a year, then came home to find her power cut off. There's Alan Skeecock whose bank account was raised for, raided for $11,000 by Hydro One to make up for two years of their mistaken bills. Mr. Speaker, to say the least, the government should be embarrassed for its lack of action and for its gross mismanagement of this file. And I say to the minister, will you apologize to the people of Ontario, the tens of thousands of people that you ripped off and resigned today? Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to thank the Ombudsman and his team for his comprehensive and thorough report and recommendations. As a result of the new IT <coughs> Others will be cut off quite quickly, too. Please finish. Speaker, as a result of a new IT billing system, an unacceptable number of Hydro One's customers over an extended period of time received an unacceptable level of service. The CEO of Hydro One and the government have apologized to those impacted, Mr. Speaker. And while we know that Hydro One has been working hard to resolve the issues, the Hydro One has outlined that work in detail. Further work and remediation is still required, Mr. Speaker. I have therefore asked the chair of Hydro One, David Dennison, Answer. to report back to me within 40 days with a detailed action plan describing how Hydro One can further address the recommendations in the Ombudsman's report. Thank you. I'll say more in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much. Uh, back to the Minister of Energy. Minister, the Ombudsman revealed that the billing errors cost Hydro One and therefore the Ontario ratepayer. $88.3 million. But not to worry, Minister, you could get most of that back if Garrison Petawawa, in my writing, were to pay the $50.7 million bill it received in error. Or if the Beaver Valley Ski Club, Ski Club paid the incorrect $37 million bill it received. There you go. Minister, you're the minister responsible for Hydro One, and throughout this entire fiasco, you have been asleep at the switch. It is time that you were unplugged. Will you take responsibility today and resign? Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to invoke my rule. Uh, those that decide to have the last laugh when I'm standing will be named. Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, Hydro One's commitment to customer service will go beyond focusing Member from Bruce Gray on stabilizing the IT billing system, which is now well in hand. It will focus on a cultural change and continuous improvement. Mr. Speaker, moving forward with a broadened ownership will make a better company to serve Ontario ratepayers and will unlock investments in infrastructure. The newly appointed chair of Hydro One, David Dennison, is overseeing a process, Mr. Speaker, the to select the CEO Hastings. and several other senior managers. Second time. Additionally, the chair and the Minister of Energy are in the process of restructuring the board of directors. This approach will create a better company that will Member operate more efficiently and better Answer. serve the interests of Ontario and the customers of Hydro One. And no, I will not resign. Final supplementary. Back to the minister. You know, when uh, there's nothing else left, it's resort to talking points. Yeah. Man, you know, I can only imagine how long this problem would continue if my colleagues. Stop the clock, please. <laughs> minister of Transportation. Please finish. I can only imagine how long this would have continued if my colleague from Lanark Front and Lennox and Addington hadn't asked the Ombudsman to investigate Hydro One. In the future, the Ombudsman or any other officer of the Legislature won't be able to investigate Hydro One because your budget bill will remove that oversight. Scam. Minister, that is anything but transparent. Will you commit today to remo removing all references to Hydro One from the budget until a much more thorough study of this systemic problem can be completed. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the budget bill does have provisions, if passed, that require Hydro One to create an internal ombudsperson to protect consumers and ensure fairness. Mr. Speaker, we have retained former Auditor General. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, we've retained the former Federal Auditor General of Canada, Mr. Denny Deshotel, to oversee the process to ensure it is established with transparency and accountability. We have also established a customer service advisory panel as an independent body to recommend service commitments across all levels of the organization. The, the members of the University Creek. President, a well-known consumer advocate, a former Ontario De Deputy Minister, the CEO of Credit Answer. Solutions Canada, and the former Chief of the Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation. I have asked Hydro One's board to work closely Thank you. with Mr. Deshotel and the advisory panel. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Selling off Hydro One is the most radical policy change in a generation, and not a single Ontarian voted for it. That's right. Now the Premier is trying to rush her Hydro One fire sale through without even consulting people and without even giving them a say. Will the Premier take Hydro One out of the budget bill so Ontarians can have their say on her sell-off? Thank you. You seated, it, please. You seated, it, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, so what the leader of the third party is asking is whether we will take our investment in transportation and transit infrastructure out of the budget, Mr. Speaker. We actually will not do that because we know how important those investments are. The leader of the third party knows that we put in our budget, we ran in our platform on a policy of investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, because there's not a community in this province that doesn't need investment, whether it's roads and bridges in our rural and small towns, Mr. Speaker, and in the north, or whether whether it's transit in our urban communities, Mr. Speaker, all of those communities need investment. That has been a cornerstone of our plan, our economic plan. So, Mr. Speaker, no, we're not going to take that out of the budget. Thank you. Supplementary. want their say on the Premier's plan to sell off their Hydro One. 451 people applied to present to the Finance Committee, Speaker, but less than a quarter have been able to speak. Hundreds more wanted to present but couldn't, Speaker, because the Premier kept the committee on lockdown here in Toronto. Taking Hydro One out of the budget bill, Speaker, is a very reasonable request. The Premier can pass her budget, flawed though it is, and Ontarians can actually have a say on the sell-off of their public utility Hydro One. Now, will the Premier make her Hydro One sell-off a separate bill 
and hold hearings across Ontario so that people can have their say on what happens to their hydro water. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that there was the opportunity for people to come and speak to the uh, budget bill, Mr. Speaker. I, I know that there were dozens of people who had that opportunity, and I just want to, uh, I just want to draw on some of that, uh, some of that material. So, Mary Frances Turner, Regional Municipality of York, said. From the perspective of transit and transportation investment, this budget continues a long-awaited investment in public transit. The $16 billion in dedicated funds that are going to be made available for transportation and other critical infrastructure across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area through the Move Ontario Forward Plan will have enormous beneficial impacts on growth, sustainability and the li liability of this region for, dec for decades to come. That was Mary Frances Turner from the Regional Municipality of York, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Annette Fisturin, Enerstore, Mr. Speaker. I think the redistribution of capital Answer. and getting capital to work in favour of Ontarians is really critical for this committee to consider. Many times in my career, we've had to reallocate capital to places that needed it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, burying the sell-off of Hydro One in an omnibus budget bill is just the wrong thing to do. Ramming through a Stephen Harper-style omnibus budget with only four days of hearings is the wrong thing to do. That's not enough time to debate the biggest change in public policy in Ontario in a generation, nor does it give people a chance to actually have their say. Will this Premier take her foot off the gas speaker, listen to Ontarians, and take Hydro One out of the budget bill so they can have full and proper scrutiny and debate across this province? Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know the fact is that uh, we put in place six days of hearings, which is far above the average, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is, well, the the, the, the third party says that it's four days. Yes, it's four days of hearings and two days of uh, of uh, clause by clause. But, Mr. Speaker, I guess when they were in office and had one day of hearings, it was just clause by clause. Nobody would have been able to. Uh, to uh, depute. Mr. Speaker, let's hear what the Cement Association of Canada says, because um, Steve, Steve Morrissey had a, a comment to the committee. The billions of dollars invested in infrastructure are having a noticeable effect on the average age of the province's infrastructure and on the lives of the people of Ontario. These investments are helping transform the province while also enhancing competitiveness, which is crucial in Ontario today. We also applaud the government's decision to expand the Moving Ontario Forward Plan to $31.5 billion. The investments in public transit, such as the GO Transit expansion, which is helping connect communities in Toronto, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Ottawa, and many other public transit investments, Thank are you. helping us to move within our communities. Yep. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you so much. Ontarians have been packing town hall meetings. They have been signing petitions, Speaker. They have been on the lawn of Queen's Park. They have been sending letters and emails to Liberal MPPs. They are sending a message, Speaker, Speaker that they cannot afford to pay the price for selling Hydro One. Ontarians are the owners of Hydro One, Speaker, and they deserve to be heard. Will this Premier do the right thing? separate her Hydro One scheme, put it into its own bill, and actually consult with the people of Ontario who own Hydro One. So, Mr. Speaker, I wonder when the leader of the third party brings those people together in her meetings around the province, I wonder if she tells the people in that room that they will continue to own 40 per cent of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if she tells them that the way the price of hydro, the price of electricity is set now by the Ontario Energy Board is the way it will be set after this change, Mr. No Speaker. Change. I wonder if she tells them that the regulatory controls that are in place now will stay in place, Mr. Speaker, and that they will continue to have control of the board, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if she tells them that, and then I wonder if she makes it clear to them that the reason we are doing this, Mr. Speaker, is so that we can invest in the transit and transportation infrastructure in their communities, in every community around this province, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if that is part of her speaking note, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
So because Ontarians are sending a very clear message. Stop the sale of Hydro One. Selling Hydro One will mean giving up a strategic, strategic control of an electricity system, of our electricity system. It is this control that allows us to make decisions, Speaker, that are in the best interests of all of the people of Ontario, not just some shareholders. Selling Hydro One will mean higher hydro rates for Ontarians, Ontarians who already pay some of the highest hydro bills in the country. New Democrats are proposing a very constructive way forward, Speaker. Remove Hydro One from this Harper-style omnibus budget bill. Let the sell-off stand on its own. Give people a say, Speaker. Will the Premier sever Hydro One from her omnibus budget bill today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, uh, the leader of the third party knows full well that the uh, provisions that we've put in the, the budget bill are an integral part of the budget, Mr. Speaker. We've made it clear that investing in transit is a core pillar of our economic plan going forward, Mr. Speaker, and we ran on a plan to review the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario to maximize those assets in order to be able to invest in the assets that are needed for the future, Mr. Speaker, and to create jobs in the interim, and that is what we were doing. So, the leader of the third party is asking that we remove those provisions. We remove the ability to invest in transit and transportation infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to do that because Ontario's economy needs those investments, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. People expect this kind of undemocratic behaviour from Stephen Harper. Oh. They deserve better from their premier, especially after she promised to lead the most open and transparent government in all of Canada. Selling hydro is a big deal, Speaker. Once it's gone, it is gone forever. Bills will only go up, Speaker. We will lose control of a strategic asset that supports jobs, that supports energy efficiency and conservation. Ontarians deserve better. I apologize for the interruption. I'm dealing with people on both sides having conversations. Thank you. Please finish. Ontarians deserve better than ramming the budget through the legislature in a Harper-style omnibus budget bill. Question. Will this premier, will this premier do the right thing by the people of Ontario? Sever Hydro One out of her omnibus budget Thank bill you. today. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the opposition continue to. Uh, uh, attribute to this initiative uh, the, the, the fact that rates will potentially go up, Mr. Speaker. You know, before committee last week, the CEO of the Ontario Energy Board, Rosemary LeClaire, made this statement. The OEB public hearing process is rigorous and requires utilities to provide comprehensive business plans. Proposals are examined and challenged come to in order. an open, public and transparent process, which includes the active participation of ratepayer representatives as well as other stakeholders. In fact, the OEB is one of few energy regulators that provides significant funding to ensure that the voices of those impacted by our decisions are represented effectively in our proceedings. Mr. Speaker, and the record shows that they continually the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington will withdraw. Thank you. Carry on. The record, Mr. Speaker, continually shows that the OED yes, is, is, is reducing uh, significantly, or in fact, reducing in a significant way the rates of the national. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In his first opportunity to travel as PC leader, Patrick Brown not only chose to go to Northern Ontario, he chose the Ring of Fire. I saw the excitement in his eyes. He gets it. He saw the huge potential in the Ring of Fire. Order. My, uh, my statement still holds on all sides. Finish, please. Speaker, he saw the huge potential in the Ring of Fire, an opportunity of a lifetime to create jobs and help turn Ontario's economy around. But what he didn't see were the hundreds of miners who used to work at the base camp. They're all gone. They're down to a half dozen workers, all because this government has done nothing for six 
So let's put it to the test. It stops now. Wrap up, please. Thank you. We uh, can tell this hit a nerve because they've done nothing for seven years. Premier Patrick Brown wants the Ring of Fire to be at the centre of the economic plan for Question. Ontario. Why is it that Patrick Brown spent more time in his first two weeks Thank on the you. job in the Ring of Fire than you have? Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, when I was paddling the Attawapiskat River in the Ring of Fire oh. area, I actually didn't notice two years ago any of the members of the opposition on the river with me, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> when, I, when I have traveled repeatedly to the north and met with First Nations, when I flew to Webequay, Mr. Speaker, and met with the community and talked about the training opportunities that are now in place, Mr. Speaker, so that people in Webequay could be part of the development of the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker. I actually didn't hear a comment from the Leader of the Opposition. When we were working, Mr. Speaker, to put together a framework agreement with the Mattawa First Nations, when we were working to put together— The member from Dufferin counted in the second time. Please finish. Yes, the Development Corporation, Mr. Speaker, to Answer. ensure that First Nations and business and the provincial government were together. But, Mr. Speaker, where was Patrick Brown when he was Thank the you. MP, Mr. Speaker? Yes. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Here, well, uh, you know, McLean's magazine called your strategy a hodgepodge of hope, pray, and blame Ottawa. Well, that's your answer for everything. Blame Ottawa. But you haven't even made an application for a ring of fire. You're blaming them in advance, Premier. Quit pointing your fingers and actually get something done. Our leader, Patrick Brown, has already traveled to the Ring of Fire. He got his hands covered in nickel and chromite dust. He looked into the eyes of the people left there, and he gave them hope. Seven years have passed. Order. Final wrap-up part of the question. Seven years have passed since the discovery of the Ring of Fire. Premier, how many more years have to pass before you actually Thank do you. anything? Premier. Well, I'd be happy to uh, brief Mr. Brown on how you get from Pickle Lake into the Ottawa. Yeah. Yeah. How you can actually canoe? How you can actually canoe into the Ring of Fire area, Mr. Speaker? I'd be happy to brief him on that. And I hope that now that he is a provincial, uh, a provincial representative, or he's not actually yet, but now that he's uh, with the provincial government, Mr. Speaker, that that he will call on Ottawa to match the billion That's dollars right. that we have put up, Mr. Speaker, to actually build the infrastructure. Because if the member opposite is not aware, what is really needed is infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely important that we build infrastructure to allow the Ring of Fire to be developed. That's why we've committed a billion dollars. That's why we've been working with the First Nations, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we can get that infrastructure built. And the commitment of a billion dollars. In case you didn't hear, the member from Nipissing, come to order, please. You ask the question, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings, warning. You are warned. Finish, please. The billion dollars to that infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, goes way beyond talk and way into action, and that's what we need from the federal yeah, yeah. government as well, Mr. Speaker.
Question. The member from Toronto, Dan Forker. My question to the Premier. This morning, Ontario's independent ombudsman released his findings into the 10,000-plus complaints around the billing practices of Hydro One. 10,000-plus, Speaker. The most of any investigation to date. Member from Eglinton, Lawrence. In his interim report, the ombudsman pointed out that inquiries from his office around some of the most egregious of these billings for Hydro One customers were already getting action, what the ombudsman calls his moral suasion. Speaker, with the Premier's promises of gold at the end of the rainbow for investors and accelerated timelines by this government around the sale of Hydro One, should Ontarians expect that the largest investigation ever undertaken by an independent officer of the legislature will just be shelved. Mr. Speaker, uh, I've indicated earlier today that uh, we take these, uh, this report very conference. seriously. Uh, we thank the Ombudsman for, uh, House for his, uh, for his, uh, extensive, his extensive uh, uh, report, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are going beyond uh, what's already happened, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've asked the chair of Hydro One, the new chair of Hydro One, uh, David Dennison, to report back to me within 40 days with a detailed action plan describing how Hydro One can further address the recommendations in the Ombudsman's report. Mr. Speaker, as well, uh, uh, Mr. Dennison is overseeing a process to select a CEO and several other senior managers. And additionally, uh, the chair and the Minister of Energy are in the process of restructuring uh, the Board of Directors. Mr. Speaker, Answer. we're changing the culture in Hydro One and moving forward. It's going to be efficient, it's going to be a growth company, and it's going to be benefiting the people of Ontario. Bravo. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Speaker, when the Premier was down in the States pitching the sale of Hydro One, she knew the Ombudsman report was soon to be tabled. Speaker, were prospective investors told about the Ombudsman's investigation, or did the Premier simply say, don't worry, we're writing the Ombudsman out of the picture, and if you bank on us, that report, with its 10,000 complaints plus, that just goes away. Wow. Mr. Speaker, as we know, the legislation contemplates an embedded Ombudsman being appointed for Hydro One, and we have retained, Mr. Speaker, the uh, former Federal uh, Auditor General, Mr. Denny Dozotel, to oversee the process to ensure it is established with transparency and accountability. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Dozotel, a man of tremendous credibility and experience as Auditor General of Canada, is overseeing the, the, the uh, process for the IPO and is also overseeing the appointment uh, of uh, an embedded ombudsman to ensure uh, that it is in place with transparency and accountability, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. As the member for Halton and as a daily commuter, I hear often about how important public transit is to those living in my community. Every weekday, Go Transit has 18 daily trips and accommodates roughly 30,000 passengers on the Milton Line, giving it the second highest ridership of the Go train lines on the network. As part of the budget 2015, our government included $13.5 billion in improvements across the GO Transit network. This will lay the foundation for regional express rail. This is great news, Mr. Speaker, but those living in my community want to know exactly how these new investments will benefit them. Can the minister please tell members of this House how these new investments will help those Question. living in Halton Region? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Halton for her question and for the advocacy uh, that she uh, provides on a regular basis for her community. She is quite correct. Our government is making a $13.5 billion investment to improve the GO Transit network, which will help increase transit ridership and reduce travel times. This will res result, Speaker, in more than a doubling of peak service and a quadrupling of off-peak service compared to today, and reduce journey times for some cross-region transit trips by as much as 50%. The Milton Corridor itself will have service every 15 minutes or better during the morning and afternoon peak travel periods. And within the next five years, Speaker, the number of weekly trips on the Milton Corridor will grow from 90 to more than 100. Metrolinx will continue to work very closely with our government and CP, who owns a portion of the track, to find ways to increase and improve service for those living in Halton Region. Answer, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his response and his efforts. I'm glad to hear that those living in Halton can expect to see increased Go Rail service through the Moving Ontario Forward plan. My constituents want to know that our government is continuing to make critical investments in transit and transportation that will help keep my community moving forward. In fact, since 2003, Ontario has committed more than $278 million to improve transit in Halton, including $5.1 million in Milton. But one concern that I continue to hear from my constituents and experience personally as a transit rider relates to parking at the Milton Go station. Some Go riders are concerned that they aren't able to find a space to park in the morning. Can the minister please tell members of this House what our government is doing Question. to help address these concerns? Thank, Thank you. you, Minister. Thanks again, Speaker, and I want to thank that member for her question. We know that many of those who commute on GO Transit rely on parking at GO stations. That's why we built over 3,500 spaces along the Milton Line through communities like Mississauga and in Milton itself over the last 10 years, including 670 spaces in Milton alone. Metrolinx's parking plan has also identified the potential for an additional six to eight hundred spaces, six hundred to eight hundred spaces at the Milton GO station, and we are undertaking feasibility studies to determine how those could be accommodated. In the meantime, Speaker, we're also moving forward with the GO Connect pilot project. Led by Milton Transit, this project provides an innovative way to get to and from the Milton GO station through the use of a dial-a-ride web and mobile app, the first application of its kind in North America. Speaker, we're committed to working with municipal partners like Min Milton Transit to address Local needs and get people moving across our region. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. The question the member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, for months you've refused to hold anyone accountable for the allegations of bribery in the Sudbury by election. Now you want to turn out the lights on a TVO documentary. Taxpayers spent over $114,000 for your infomercial that you want to shut down. It's an indictment to you and your government that even when trying to film a documentary, the footage looks more like a crime drama. You personally invited the director to film you in Sudbury, and it's obvious that there's something in that footage that you don't want to see the light of day. Will you stop acting like a censor and direct TVO to air this documentary and turn over the raw footage to the OPP? Yes. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, as, the, as I have said publicly, we worked, uh, we worked closely with the producer to determine what the parameters, what the scope of the film would be, Mr. Speaker, um, and it was to be a, a behind-the-scenes look at the budget, Mr. Speaker, and over the course of the filming, there, were some, there was a discussion, Mr. Speaker, about the scope of, that, uh, of the film. We shared these concerns with the producer, uh, and our soul, that was our sole, uh, our sole uh, contact for the project, not TVO, Mr. Speaker. Um, there was always a clear understanding that we wouldn't have editorial control. That was uh, that was understood. I have not seen any of the footage, Mr. Speaker. I've said that publicly. That is true. I've never seen any of the footage. And um, you know, we're really still hoping that the film can happen. Remember. Thank you. That's enough. Please finish. And Mr. Speaker, the reason that uh, I and we agreed to this was that there is a film that was made under the Bill Davis the era, Lanark, Mr. Speaker, explaining time. how government works, and that really did need to be updated. I and hope sir, that it will still go ahead, Mr. Speaker. Two supplementary. You know, uh, back to the Premier. You know, once again, the Premier's story is there's nothing to see here, folks. The problem is every time you say that, the OPP and the Chief Electoral Officer think differently. If there's truly nothing to hide, then prove it. Let's all have a look at the movie. I'll even buy the popcorn, Premier. Over the weekend, you said, Premier, that you hope the film will be aired. Well, if that's the case, I expect you to show some accountability by signing the release forms after question period. Will you sign those forms, or will you force the OPP investigators to sign yet another warrant for, uh, for this scandal? Premier. Speaker, once again, I will just say that uh, we agreed to a scope of the film. I agreed to do this film, Mr. Speaker, because I thought there needed to be an update on a film that had been made uh, in the Bill Davis era, Mr. Speaker. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. The member from uh, Dufferin, Caledon is warned. Could be now if you want. 
Finish, please. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, you know, we're hoping that the film will be aired. There, is, uh, there was a discussion about the scope of the film. My understanding up until, uh, until this became public, Mr. Speaker, was that the film was going ahead, that we were going to be able to. I have not seen the footage, and I hope that uh, we'll, still be able to, uh, we'll still be able to see it aired, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good question. The member, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Education Premier. Speaker, under this Liberal government and a Premier who dubbed herself a negotiator, our schools have been thrown into chaos. In an effort to save a few bucks to pay off their scandals, the Liberals cut $250 million from education over 2014-2015 and diminished special education funding across Ontario. And we know there's more to come. Students and families are paying the price for this government's short-sighted cuts to education. Speaker, will the Premier admit that her reckless, reckless cuts to education system have thrown our schools into chaos? Premier. Well, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, let me first say that uh, this is a question from a member of the party that I would have thought believed in the collective bargaining process yeah. as a start, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Certainly, uh, the NDP used to believe in the collective bargaining process. We worked with our partners, Mr. Speaker, to put a collective bargaining process in place. That collective bargaining process has, has unfolded as it has, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the Minister of Education said today, we have just received the, uh, uh, advisory from, the advice from the Education Relations Commission, Mr. Speaker. And I would just say that I hope if there is concern um, in the uh, third party for the, the students, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that the third party will be supporting our legislation, which would get kids back to school as quickly as possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, we learned that central table negotiations with OSSTF have broken down. The Premier and her minister have not been successful in any level of negotiation with any board under this two-tiered system they so proudly introduced not long ago. Shame. Is this the new direction for relationships with teachers that the Premier espoused as a leadership candidate? To make matters Deputy worse, House leader, the Liberal, time. Liberal government is abandoning its commitment to keep class sizes manageable, directly impacting learning conditions for our students. Speaker, why is this government forcing students and families to pay the price for their mismanagement of the education portfolio in this province? Well, Mr. Speaker, let's just talk about what we have, uh, what we've been able to do in the last number of years for students in this province and for the education system. But reminding the member opposite that the process that is in place right now is one that was developed in partnership, Mr. Speaker, with the education sector, with the boards, with the unions, with the federations, Mr. Speaker, because we all knew that there needed to be a new process and that it needed to have a provincial and a local component. So that process is in place, and Mr. Speaker, you know, it is uh, the first time that the process has been used, and there's no doubt that it's been a tough collective bargaining process, but it is a process that everyone agreed to. But Mr. Speaker, the fact is that the uh, our budget, our 2015 budget, will protect the gains that we've made in education, Mr. Speaker. $120 million over three yes, years sir. to create thousands of childcare spaces, $40 million in technology and innovation in classrooms from K-12, to Experience Ontario, Mr. Speaker, which will invest $20 million over three years Thank to you. help graduating high school students get experience. Thank you. Your question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. In my time as a care coordinator for CCAC, I often heard from my patients their desire to receive quality care within the comfort of their own homes and communities rather than in hospitals or long-term care homes. Helping more people receive care quickly and close to home, not only in my riding of Cambridge but across the province, is essential to providing Ontarians with the highest possible quality of care in the most comfortable and familiar setting for them. Currently, home care is provided to over 600,000 Ontarians per year, while community support service assists an additional 1.46 million, many of whom are seniors. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House what this government is doing to further improve our home and community care services throughout Question. the province? Question. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to say thank you to the member from Cape Cambridge uh, for this question. And since 2003, our government has more than doubled the funding provided for home and community services. Uh, in fact, one of the four pillars in our government's Patients First Action Plan outlines our goal of improving these services with a commitment to delivering better coordinated and integrated care within communities closer to home. And building on this commitment, earlier this month I announced our Patients First a roadmap to strengthen home and community care. It's the first phase in our plan to transform the way we deliver care at home and in the community, and with a 2015 budget commitment of an additional $750 million over three years, our government has put forth a roadmap for the future of home and community care. And in fact, our plan endorses all of the recommendations Answer. outlined in Bringing Care Home, a report published by the Provincial Expert Panel led by Dr. Gail Donner. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Care coordinators, patients and families in my community of Cambridge will be pleased to know about our government's plan to improve home and community care. It certainly was improved over my years there. Our loved ones with needs that can be reasonably met within their homes or communities will receive the support to do so, and with high quality and consistent care across the province. Speaker, we know that care at home and in the community often goes well beyond the patient themselves. There's often a circle of family, friends and other caregivers involved. It's important that patients and their caregivers have control over what this care looks like and that we recognize the unique situations of patients across the province. Speaker, can the minister let this House know other initiatives in the community and health care sector, home care sector that meets Question. the needs of patients and their caregivers alike? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, included in our $750 million investment to improve access and expand services for home and community care, we are funding an additional 80,000 hours of nursing care. Wow. We're expanding supports for family caregivers and personal support workers. We're increasing choice for patients and their families regarding the palliative and end-of-life care they receive. And Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the vastly different needs of people across the province and will provide patients with greater choice and greater control to ensure that care plans are as individualized as possible. That's why we're piloting different approaches such as self-directed funding to allow clients and their families greater autonomy over the care they receive. And our plan puts patients and their caregivers at the absolute center of our system. It not only gives them the support they need in achieving the highest quality of care that they deserve, yes, but it allows them a greater say in what that care should look like. Thank you. The question of the member from Lanark, Connor, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. The Speaker, to the Premier. Premier, my family's story is no different than thousands of other families here in Ontario. We are a family of smokers. It has been generational. My parents smoked. My brothers and sisters smoked. My children smoke. This addiction is not just generational. It's also cultural. And like most smokers, we've tried gums and patches, and they seldom work. But since I've started using a vaporizer, I've cut back significantly. So has my family. It's meant that we can spend more time with our grandsons. It's meant that for the first time in generations, we might end this trend. It means my grandsons may not grow up in a family of smokers. Premier, your government is making a tragic mistake. Will you please reconsider and spend more time investigating vaporizers before you rush to a decision that will prevent people Question. like myself and my family and thousands of others from quitting tobacco once and for all with Schedule 3 Thank you. Bill 45. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for his question, but I really hope he's read Bill 45. I know he sat on the committee, and if he fully understood the bill, he would know that we're not banning electronic cigarettes. All we are doing is we are regulating electronic cigarettes to make sure that we balance the potential benefits, which we recognize, against the potential risks. But it continues to be perfectly legal for adults, and I'm sure the member opposite agrees that we shouldn't have 16-year-olds being able to buy uh, an e cigarette or be able to smoke inside a classroom, and that is what we are doing. All we are doing is regulating, but there's nothing in the regulation that stops a potential smoker from choosing to use an electronic cigarette if that's what they want to do. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I have, read the, I have read the bill, and I did attend the committee hearings all. Premier, there are only two groups that benefit from you passing Schedule 3. 
Order, please. Thank you. Please put your question. Premier, there is only two groups that benefit from passing Schedule 3 of Bill 45, and it's not children or the general public. Two of the most vocal opponents and the two groups set to gain the most from this bill are Big Tobacco and Big Pharma. By demonizing vaporizers, you are helping tobacco companies regain a market share that has been devastated by vaporizers. You're also allowing pharmaceutical co companies to continue to market cessation products over the counter that are proven less than effective than vaporizers. Premier, how can it be that myself and others who are addicted to cigarettes are fighting big tobacco while you Question. and your government are actively protecting and defending big tobacco. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe this government's commitment to anti-smoking is the gold standard. So I don't know where he's coming from when you say that we're supporting big tobacco. On the issue of Schedule 3, on the issue of electronic cigarettes, as you, if you've read Bill 45 clearly, the way we have drafted Bill 45 is to make it very flexible. Should it ever come to pass that Health Canada says that e-cigarettes are a legitimate cessation device, we have regulations in place that would actually allow us to very quickly change regulations and ensure that it, it's a uh, treated exactly the same as any other cessation device. In the interim, while we await better evidence, all we are doing is regulating electronic cigarettes. You can continue to use it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Since 2013, the workers at Crown Holdings, Inc. have walked the picket line in an attempt to stop a steep rollback of their pensions, their benefits and their wages. 21 months now, two winters. The government promised an industrial inquiry, but so far there's been no action. This is an untenable situation, Speaker, and the government should be stepping up to the plate. Will this government finally take some action on this long-standing dispute? Thank you. Can you be seated, please? Be seated, please. Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the uh, for the very important question. We have indeed acted on this, and it's a very rare step that we've taken. In the province of Ontario, over 97% of collective agreements are reached at the table. Correct. In this case, we have one. We have an outlier. We have a very exceptional circumstance. The reason that we took the unusual step of appointing the Industrial Inquiry Commission was to make, uh, uh, Commissioner was to make sure that we got to the bottom of this, to make right, sure yeah. that we understood exactly what had transpired over this period of time to allow this to go on for so long without an agreement. I meet on a regular basis with Mr. Mort Michnik, who is a very, very well-respected uh, individual that has a huge, uh, huge background yes, in the field of labour relations law. He will be reporting back his findings to me in the very near future, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, time's a ticking. People should be able to go to work and be paired, paid a fair wage and not have to walk a picket line for nearly two years in the province of Ontario. People should not have to live on strike pay for two years and have to appeal to their union to make a mortgage payment. It's time for the Premier and the Seven government of Ontario affairs. to stop looking the other way. Will this Premier, will this government force binding arbitration in the Crown holding situation and ensure that all of those that are now out on the picket line will be able to return to work with a fair deal? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government's preference is always to encourage the parties to resolve whatever differences they have at the bargaining table. If they need assistance with that, Speaker, we've got excellent arbitrators, we've got excellent mediators that we bring to the table to ensure that every single avenue is explored in search of that, uh, of that agreement. Speaker, this morning I met with the uh, I met with some of the steel workers in front of my office from Crown Metals. Good. Had a very good conversation with them, a very amiable con uh, conversation. I understand the frustration level, Speaker. I committed to them that we would get to the bottom of this and we would find a resolution that suits their needs and their desires, Speaker. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, a local constituent from my riding at Brampton Springdale just landed her very first job at a grocery store. She is very excited, but at the same time nervous. She is afraid that she may not understand what she is entitled to and what she, will, what she won't get breaks when working long hour shifts or overtime pay when she's asked to stay late. Minister, we know the ministry requires all employers across the province to, uh, to inform their employees about the Employment Standards Act. Usually, this is done by posting a copy of the Employment Standards poster where, somewhere accessible in the workplace, outlining employee rights including overtime, minimum wage, breaks, vacation pay, public holidays, among other, and amongst others outlined in the ESA. My question is for the minister. How can it be assured that current employees and new hires, such as my constituent, are aware of their rights, and what steps has your ministry put into place to ensure that the employees have access, access information about question. their ESA rights? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member from Brampton Springdale for what I think is a very, very important question. Speaker, this government works hard to ensure that all Ontarians are treated with the dignity and the respect they deserve at work. Um, in order to do that, to assist in that last fall, Speaker, we passed the Stronger Workplaces for a Stronger Economy Act. It introduced two very important changes to the Employment Standards Act. As of May 20th, Speaker, Ontario law now requires speak, uh, employers to distribute copies of the latest version of the Employment Standards poster to all employees by June 19th of this year. Very important. For new hires, such as your, your uh, constituent that the, uh, the honourable member mentioned, this information must be provided to them as a new employee within 30 days of their hiring. So it's not sufficient anymore, Speaker, for employees to Answer. simply post this information in the workplace. Employment standards officers now have the authority to require employers to conduct a self-audit. Any failure to post and distribute will be met with enforcement, Speaker. Thank you. Wow. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Labour, who I would like to thank for his reply and for addressing this important issue before the House today. These new requirements under the ESA will help employees further understand their basic workplace rights. However, Minister, in my riding of Brampton Springdale, there is a large ethnic community, and I am worried that many of my constituents may have difficulty reading and understanding their basic rights listed on the poster. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, what steps has the Ministry taken to ensure that all employees, regardless of ethnicity or language, will be able to read and understand their rights under the ESA? And where can employers and employees gain access to the latest version of the poster? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Minister. Better answer. Thank you, Speaker. We all know, I think, in this House uh, that knowledge is power, and people who know their rights can actually stand up for those rights. So, to answer the question from the honourable member, the requirement for the new version of the ASA poster outlines that it must be, uh, it must be displayed in English unless the majority of employees speak another common language. Good. If that's the case, I'll Speaker, as it may be in this example, the employer is then required to post a translated copy of the poster right next door to the English version. Good. The ESA poster must also be provided in other languages if an employee requests a translation. These translated versions, Speaker, are available from the Ministry of Labour. Right now, the poster is available in English, in French, Arabic, Chinese, Hindi, Portuguese, Punjabi, Spanish, Tagalog, Thai, and Urdu. The poster can be downloaded free of charge. It's printed on a standard 8.5 8 by 11 piece of paper. That makes it very simple for employers to distribute to their staff. Speaker, helping employees Thank and employers you. understand their workplace rights and responsibility is a part of this government's Thank you. New question. The member from Niagara West Gladwell. Thank you. Question to the uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, Minister Rex G is the kind of person we want to see more of in the province of Ontario. He's a Chinese Canadian immigrant that came to this country to work hard, provide for his family, and give back to the new country he loves. He opened up a greenhouse in Smithville, Ontario, been running for 15 years. This January, he visited his ailing parents in China, and he missed a bill for $362. 29 days later, the utility, Niagara Peninsula Energy, cut the cord. They disconnected his power. The consequences were entirely predictable. The boiler shut down, the pipes burst, his entire crop in the greenhouse was wiped out. The cost to him, $150,000. Oh, 
Minister, would you agree with me that Niagara Peninsula Energy went way, way, way too far, and they owe Mr. G compensation for the destruction Question. of his livelihood? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question from the member from Niagara West uh, Glanbrook uh, and uh, appreciate uh, that uh, he has been here regularly and uh, pleased to uh, receive a question from him. The issue he raises uh, brings, brings to uh, question uh, the role of the regulator, the Ontario Energy Board, because uh, we have, I think, something like 5 million uh, electricity customers in Ontario. And they do need a place to go with their complaints, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board uh, has a report card, uh, and uh, they, uh, they do follow up. In fact, uh, the member brought this to my attention, uh, from and his constituent has followed the appropriate process, uh, bringing the issue to the attention of the Ontario Energy Board, the independent regulator with the mandate to protect Ontario ratepayers. I understand that the Ontario Energy Board has filed a complaint with the local utility and is currently awaiting their response. There is accountability, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. I thank the uh, Minister. And, and you're right. We, we did, through my office, lodge a formal complaint with the, with the Ontario Energy Board on behalf of Mr. G. But I think we go a step farther. And I've known you, Minister, for a long time. I know in your heart you know the company did wrong. It was externally damaging, $150,000 in losses for a $362 bill. To boot, Mr. G had never missed a single payment. He paid his bills and he paid them on time. Not only this was a massive screw-up, it was cruel. You play a unique role. You occupy, as Theodore Roosevelt said, the bully pulpit. You are the minister. You carry a lot of weight. I know it's with the OEB and the local utility, but, Minister, will you join me? Tell Niagara Peninsula Energy to give their heads a shake, do the right thing, and pay Mr. G for his damages. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker I definitely will join him on this particular file, Mr. Speaker. Um, it is um, uh, apparently a very significant injustice uh, that has happened in this particular case. Uh, I know that the Ontario Energy Board now is actually working with the utility to try to resolve this particular issue. Uh, certainly any information that I have, I will share with the member, and I will work with the member to try to bring this to a, uh, to a positive resolution, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The the member from Waterloo. Thank you. Uh, to the Premier. Speaker, last year on the eve of an election, the Premier showed up in Waterloo to announce an agreement to give $120 million to OpenTex to create 1,200 jobs. Now we see that OpenTex will be cutting 5% of its workforce and claims the job cuts are in line with the agreement with the Liberal government. Premier, your own press release from the announcement states that support is contingent on the company meeting job targets. And since you claim to be committed to openness and transparency, will you make that agreement public so Ontarians can judge whether or not the 1,200 jobs you took credit for creating are actually going to be created? I'm really surprised, Mr. Speaker, that a member from the Kitchener community would get up and criticize the investment that we've made with OpenText to create 1,200 very important high-tech jobs and bring $2 billion of investment into this province that was on its way going elsewhere, Mr. Speaker. What OpenText is doing is they're creating an R&D hub here in Ontario instead of somewhere else in the world, so that those 1,200 high-tech jobs will be here in Ontario, in your community, and you're getting up to criticize that investment. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of that investment. I'm proud of the 1,200 jobs we're creating in Kitchener, and I'm proud of the $2 billion that we're bringing into our economy. You should be, too. You see it, please? There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.